Welcome to Muslim Apologetics Australia. I'm Mustafa Sahin and I'm going to go through Zara Kay's video. She's an ex-Muslim and she talks about why she left Islam. And just as I have debunked other ex-Muslims stories about why they've actually claimed they've left Islam, uh, I've done videos against people like um, Abdullah Samir. He's got a story of why he actually left Islam. Um, I've also done a refutation against uh, Harris Sultan. Uh, again, I'll put the hyperlinks below this video so you can see my responses to them. And by the way, um, it's nothing really new. All of their stories are the same. So they always have the same points. Uh, so I'll just, what I'll do is, if it's already been addressed, if it's already been responded to, I'll put it, I'll put a hyperlink below this video and you can actually go to it because I don't want to keep repeating it because obviously it's going to be about apostasy, child marriages and all this stuff, right? So it's going to be a repetition basically. So if I mean, this is the first time I'm going through the video. I haven't even watched it. This is the first time I'm watching it. I'm actually responding while I'm watching it now live for the first time. I haven't seen it. But I know it's going to be repetitive arguments. Uh, so just so I don't make this a very long video, all I'm going to do is put hyperlinks below this video. And I'll put... Um, time frame, I'll put, you know, uh, this topic, the subject, the question raised, and I'll put a link below showing a refutation to the questions asked. Uh, also, it's interesting because uh, if they were honest, they would say, Zara K X Shia, why they've left X Shiism. But no, they'll put X Muslim, why I left Islam. And <laughs> we don't consider the Shias Muslim. Uh, but of course, I'll run with the narrative that they are Muslim. But anyway, let's go th through the video. Hi, uh, I'm Zara. I'm the founder of Faithless Ajabi. And a lot of you have recently been asking me why I've left the so-called religion of peace. And these are my reasons for why I left. Okay, um, I'll also put a hyperlink below this video. Um, and you can see how Zara Kay has lied about the Tanzanian government, about her being arrested for blasphemy laws. Um, and so you need to understand that there's a motivation why they're coming out and blowing their own trumpets. It's because of fame and money that they're trying and, and you know, to sell books and be famous. Uh, this is what it's about. Um, and so, yeah, refer to that video where she gets exposed by Ali Dawa about this. Um, and anyway, so we'll go through why she's left Islam. And, you know, till this day, I haven't seen a single, by Allah, I haven't seen a single argument that puts doubt in my heart. Single. Because once you build knowledge and understanding about your din, all those doubts go. You know, if all those questions go, they, they get refuted. And what you need to understand is she comes from a Shia family. And if her parents aren't educated on mainstream Islam, on mainstream hadith, understanding scholarly work, of course, you know, I'm surprised that all of Shias haven't left Islam, <laughs> right? Because they don't have the understanding of the din. Uh, so, and, you know, when you watch this video, you'll see, because uh, I've only watched a little small clip from, from another video, and she mentions things that she couldn't get answers from her parents. And I'm pretty sure she'll say it in this video as well. Let's have a listen. For the longest time, I questioned the existence of God. I remember being 10 and 11, and I went up to my parents asking who created God and why he didn't have any parents or siblings. And I was told because he is all-knowing and self-created and there was nothing before him and there's nothing after him. It's just a being. But I didn't answer my questions and I kept asking around to many of my Islamic school teachers 
In the end, I realized nobody really had the answer to it, so I brushed it off. As I grew older, I started questioning um, the hijab. I start, I wore... Okay, so her first <laughs> point is, um, you know, this shouldn't be why I left Islam or Muslim. I mean, Muslims aren't the only people who believe in God. Um, and so to use that as an argument why you left Islam, uh, it, it shouldn't be an argument why you've left Islam. Uh, because that could apply for Christianity. I mean, that could apply for Buddhism. That could apply for Hinduism. That could apply for any other religion. Um, and so when you say, I left Islam because of this, uh, and if you want to blame Islam for that, well, you're going to have to blame all other religions as well uh, for believing in the same things. I understand it may be a reason for you to leave Islam, but you know, you're know you dedicated to try and disprove Islam. Uh, but that argument doesn't just apply for Islam. But anyway, uh, so the argument is, well, if God created everyone, well, who created God? So again, because this has been answered so many times, I'm going to put three videos one from Hamza Sorsis, I think, and two from William Lane Craig. And by the way, um, you know when they say, I left Islam because of this, what you're basically saying is, I've got absolute proof that God does not exist. Can you imagine? I haven't heard any atheist or agnostic ever say they have 100% proof that God doesn't exist. Of course, atheists would say things like, show me evidence God exists. Yeah, okay, I understand that point, you know, where we theists have to bring forward evidence that God exists. That's fair enough. The burden of proof is on us. But the burden of proof is also on you. If you're claiming that you left Islam or any religion because of the basis that there isn't proof that God exists, well, you need to also prove 100% the burden of proof because you're now making a claim. You're saying, I don't believe God exists. And if you're making a claim like that, then you also ought to prove and back it up with substantial evidence that it doesn't exist. Like, let me give you an example. I'm a Muslim. I believe in God. Uh, you know, I believe he exists. Um, and I always hear atheist arguments saying, um, you know, well, God doesn't exist. And I say to them, well, what's the evidence? And they say, well, you know what? Babies get cancer. And I'm like, okay, so you're using evidence now that God doesn't exist because of an emotional argument, because of, you know, uh, the problem of evil and suffering. Okay, but... So you're making a claim now. You're making an absolute claim that, A, God doesn't exist, B, because there's suffering. Okay, well, that doesn't prove that that God doesn't exist because one could argue that a God created the earth and the universe and he also allowed suffering i've actually heard an atheist say yeah well yeah there could be a god like that yes uh and so yeah it doesn't really dismiss god it could just mean it's an unjust god or a cruel god exactly so for sarah k to say i've left islam because of I don't. I can't. I can't rationalize and understand evidence that God exists. Well, you don't even have evidence to dismiss him. But you're like, well, I'm going to leave it anyway. So to me, that doesn't make sense. You know, unless an atheist can show me with hundred percent certainty that God doesn't exist, fine. But. No atheist has provided that sort of evidence to Zara Kay. Because I'm pretty sure if they've provided that evidence to us, 
then they would have won a Nobel Prize because they've checked all of the universe and scanned all of the galaxies and found out in this great magnificent universe, God is not there. <laughs> right? And they haven't done that. They don't have the capability to do that. And so why does then Sarah Kate leave Islam based on the assumption that God may not exist. To me, that doesn't make sense. I understand she may say, well, there's no proof from the theist perspective that God doesn't exist. I understand that point. But what they're saying there is they're disputing the evidence because theists are presenting evidences through you know, the design argument, intelligent design. They're showing examples there. And it is sufficient in my opinion, of course, maybe not in Zara Khan's opinion, but that to me is not enough evidence for someone to leave because unless they themselves have absolute evidence because when you leave Islam, then you're just taking an agnostic position. Well, I don't know. So you're basically giving up your salvation based on a worldview now that you have left Islam to something that is based on I don't know, assumptions. So you're moving from basically believing in God, which is one assumption, moving on to atheism, which is another assumption of the, of the idea that he may or he may not exist. So moving on to atheism hasn't made you more, you know, on the correct path. It's just taking you from religion, which you think that is not based on evidence and is not based on assurity, to atheism, which again is baseless, which is again not based on 100% certainty. So do you see where I'm going with this? Anyway, let's carry on. The hijab at the age of And I started questioning why women had to wear hijab and why they couldn't to many of my Islamic school teachers. In the end, I realized nobody really had the answer to it, so I brushed it off. Okay, so notice she says, well, to the question of, you know, God and who created God, she goes, nobody really had the answers to it, so I brushed it off. Do you understand? Now, did she honestly look for answers? Did she really? Um, what, what does that mean? I just brushed it off. I just let it go. No one really had the answers. Um, and the question is, if people do have the answers now, are you willing to come back to Islam? You see? Are you willing to now come back to Islam? And that's why um, this is where the dishonesty is. Because when you're saying nobody really had the answers, maybe she did look into the works of William Lane Craig. Maybe she did look into the works of Hamza Sorces. Um, and when you claim nobody had the answers, maybe they, they actually did have the answers, but it just didn't run with your biases. It didn't run with your desires. It didn't, you know, you just... You wanted an excuse to reject it anyway. As I grew older, I started questioning um, the hijab. I, start, I wore the hijab at the age of eight, and I started questioning why women had to wear hijab and why they couldn't take it off. So I read up on the history of hijab, which led me to the history of Muhammad. And a lot of times, whenever I read about why women have to wear hijab, it had to do a lot with men not being able to control themselves. But then, why were women subjugated to it? And how was hijab invented? And that then brought out the story of sex slavery. Um, a lot of people, I, I didn't even know about slavery at the time. And, you know, there are so many things about Islam that I wasn't taught, like the bad parts about Islam that I wasn't taught. All I knew was about the wars where Muslims were um, oppressed and they had to fight for their rights. Okay, so let's just quickly pause it there. Um, obviously, clearly, she's running with uh, the Western liberal secular viewpoint. Um, and... <laughs> 
you know, she wore the hijab at eight years old. Um, and, you know, I can assure you now that Islam prescribes the hijab probably at 13, 14 now. Um, and it seems that she was made to put the hijab on. And a lot of parents do do this, unfortunately, um, uh, without properly grounding them and educating them and making them understand about the reasons of hijab. And so if parents aren't educating them properly, what they do is Western philosophers then educate them on hijab. And so they'll come up with these narratives that the reason why women have to wear the hijab is because men can't control themselves. So I'm pretty sure you've always heard this narrative. But if Zara Kay actually researched and understood Islam and read things that are actually forbidden for women, they're actually like opening their hair. There's things that are forbidden for men in the Quran. For example, in the Quran, um, it says to men that when they do see women, that they should lower their gaze. This is what it says. Um, does this mean that men are told to lower their gaze because if, they, if women see the, the, the man's eyes, then she's not going to be able to control herself and she's just going to attack him sexually? No, of course not. So Islam puts measures on women and measures on men. Um, of course, uh, I'll put a hyperlink below this here, and there are many social experiments done that the hijab actually protects women, um, you know, against sexual abuse. And, you know, a lot of Western feminists will say, oh, well, you know, wearing the hijab doesn't prevent rape. You know, it doesn't do that. I mean, if someone wants to rape a woman, they'll just still rape a woman. Uh, but there are social experiments showing, and I'll put a hyperlink below this video, where a woman was walking in New York without a hijab and she was getting whistles, stares, men trying to hit up on her, carrying on walking next to her. And then a woman did the same experiment wearing a hijab and she wasn't harassed. And so they've got this notion that in, in Western philosophy that a woman should be able to dress the way she wants. And they think that they live in a utopia where we live amongst good human beings. And so everyone should respect each other's boundaries. But I'm sorry, um, you know, <laughs> their argument is like, if I jump into a, ca a lion's cage, then I'm going to expect that the lion is not going to bite me. And if it does, then you know what? It's a lion's fault. I mean, that's how stupid it sounds. We have sexual predators in our society. We have people who are sick. We have pedophiles. So you're not going to leave your children in a vulnerable, in, by themselves in a park, playing on the playground. You're going to be there. You're going to sit there. You're going to surveillance the area, and you're going to protect your child from any sort of vulnerability. Uh, if you don't do that, then you know what? The blame is going to be on you. If something happens to your child, they're going to say you're a parent that doesn't show any negligence. I mean, you showed negligence here. You, you weren't there to look after your child. Um, and so you could get charged for negligence. Uh, and so we need to understand that Women also need to take responsibility. Allah puts a commandment in the Quran. Yes, men need to take responsibility as well. Of course, they're not allowed to rape. And if they do, if they sexually assault, of course, uh, Islam has a hard punishment against perpetrators. But if women do not take their own alternative measures as well, then you know they will say, oh, you're victim blaming. No, we're, we're Blaming you for negligence. Allah commands you in the Quran not to go naked and invite trouble onto yourselves. And Westerners know this. Westerners know this. I'm pretty sure Zara Kay would not go to certain places at certain times. She wouldn't walk in an alleyway in, I don't know, Chicago somewhere. 
She wouldn't do that at night time, you know, two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. She wouldn't do that because, you know, there may be a gangster there waiting to hit up on her. She wouldn't do that. You know, even if Western philosophy teaches women need to be liberal, they should be able to walk anywhere they want. And, you know, and but the truth of the matter is, I'm sorry, we don't live in a world like that. And so you need to take measures to, pre to prevent against things of this nature harming you. And so Islam understands the human condition. Islam knows that not every man is going to be righteous. There are going to be good men and there are going to be very evil men. And so you need to take your precautions. And this is why Islam has put the hijab for women due to their uh, beautification. And we know that biologically, which Zara K cannot deny, is that biologi biologically, uh, I mean, of course, women are attracted to men as well, but men are um, attracted, attractive to women's, um, to women. And we know that the sexual abuse cases, we know that more men rape women than women rape men. Okay, so we live in a world where there are statistics. These statistics are real statistics. And no matter how much you educate men, it only takes one case of rape, right, where a woman's life is totally tarnished, she goes through suicidal thoughts, she has to live with all that pain and trauma for the rest of her life, and this is why Islam believes in prevention is better than cure. And so it encourages and it commands, prescribes certain regulations. And there's nothing wrong with that. Even in Western laws, in Western academia, in Western philosophy, you can't go naked in the streets. Can you? Can Zara Kay, living in Australia, take off all her clothes and go out naked? She can't. No matter how much liberal she wants to it. Because why? There are laws in this country that you need to dress modestly and appropriately. Yes, there are certain beaches where you can go to naked beaches. There are there are special designated areas, but that does that rule doesn't apply to all places. And so they have laws, they have dress codes. But if Islam imposes a dress code, that's suddenly now oppression. That's suddenly now backwards. That's that's you know ancient. So okay, so let's continue. But nobody actually told me who started the wars. Nobody told me that Islam was spread through wars. Okay, and so she then went on to the next point about um, uh, sex slaves, sexual slavery, concubines, unbelievable. So, again, so she, and the way it was pretty manipulative how she tried to tie the hijab, women being subjugated, to sexual slavery. Um, did you know that there are men slaves as well? In Islam, men are also slaves. Uh, there are laws where there's slavery in Islam, and men uh, can be slaves as well. Through wars, they become your possession, captives, captives of war. Um, so why, why didn't she mention that? Why did she focus on women? Okay, so if it was about subjugating women, why is it that she only mentioned women, but she didn't mention men. Well, again, it's just to enforce the idea that, you know, my hijab must be tied to subjugation and then sexual slavery must be also tied to that as well because Islam focuses on subjugating women. But she didn't mention men. So about concubines, we've got a refutation on that, sexual sex slaves, as they say. Visit the hyperlink below this video. I've put a hyperlink. You can see we've already responded to the claim about sex slaves in Islam. Uh, and uh, just to paraphrase a, re a ref refutation, because I don't want to make, because of course this video could be very, very long. I understand it is going to take long, unfortunately, but I don't want to make it extra long because you've got to understand that the questions they're raising are like loading a gun. And unfortunately, it needs to be unloaded. Uh, and so 
So please be patient. I don't, I don't want to make it too long, but I will put a hyperlink below this video so you can see a more detailed refutation. This is only a brief, brief refutation. So when it comes to concubines in Islam, Islam believes in concubines. And if you look at the Hadith literature, you cannot rape your female captives. It's through mutual consent. I'll put a hyperlink under this video and you can see it for yourself. Um, of course, back in the ancient times, they didn't have prison systems. And so when a war broke out, concubines, you took concubines and just to help the burden that we don't put them in jail, we don't put them in state prisons and things like that. It was distributed and they worked in Muslim houses, but they were treated like your brothers and sisters. They were housed, they were fed. Um, and of course, Sarah Kay won't go into all that. She won't give you those details. And I've got a black brother. I think his name is... Uh, it's not Dr. Hakim Quick. It's not Hakim Quick. I, I forgot his name, but I'll put the um, video link. He speaks about, you know, um, refuting um, these points, even when it comes to slavery in Islam, even for men. And he shows points how you're supposed to treat them like your brother, uh, and, you know, you're supposed to treat them like your family basically and there are hadiths that actually say that if you beat your slave then you actually lose custody of him uh, and uh, interesting uh, I was looking at a system in Australia where they have different forms of slavery but of course they don't call it slavery um, where you actually have people who um, you know, these are people who don't want to buy houses. They don't want to live in rent because there's high mortgages and, um, you know, they've got high rental things to pay. So what they do is they actually live in people's homes. And the deal is you get to live in my home, but, um, you know, you don't have to pay for rent. You don't have to pay for electricity. You don't have to pay for anything. But the deal is you just need to maintain my house so you can wash the dishes, wash the clothes, do the landscaping, clean up the garden. And they've, got, they've actually got systems now where you can actually live like that in the Western world. Uh, but of course, they won't call that slavery. Um, but yeah, so Islam had systems like that too to actually help the poor people that you were allowed to have slaves of course the only difference is that in islam you were able to own the slave um, but that said there are laws in islam where you're actually allowed to free the slave and there are huge rewards for freeing a slave and so why wouldn't you want to take that opportunity to free the slave if there are huge rewards most of the slaves in Islam actually came from wars um, and that's why it was adopted by Islam and sometimes you need to understand that the concept of slavery of Islam people like Zara Kay may think this is like colonial slavery you know where they shackled people in chains and they brought them from Africa and they whipped them and they spat on them and they treat them with this narcissistic behavior of murder and killing if they don't obey their master and all this nonsense so all of this is all of this nonsense has been projected to the islamic concept of slavery which is totally wrong and not on the same length at all Tot it's an oxymoron so by the way anyway um, again, I don't want to make this video too long, so go to the detailed rebuttal about slavery in Islam when it comes to women and when it comes to men. Uh, you can also see Daniel Hakikato's um, video on responding to slavery. You'll, say, you'll see that even in uh, modern day did not even end slavery. If you have a look that there's forced labor of criminals even in american penal code uh, 
that in the criminal jails they must adhere to forced labour on them. So it's not just a matter of going to jail and you're punished is being secluded from society. No, not at all. But rather you must do forced labour imposed by modern American judicial system. This now seems to be similar to Sharia principles when enemy combatants are captured fighting against the Muslim government. Then instead of taking that criminal to jail facility where he undergoes some very harsh treatment like sol solitary confinement and forced labour, he can rather get sold to a citizen of the state and where he will be given fair treatment, treatment like brotherhood in Sharia, slavery requirements like living under the roof of another Muslim, as uh, that's his name actually, Kemal Al Malik. You can see the video and I'll publish it here. Uh, you can see there was a brother by Daniel Hakikato and um, uh, Apus, and uh, you'll see the same responses similar responses uh, go to the debate um, listen to Daniel Hakukato refuting this uh, and you'll see more videos here by um, another sister who's done a brilliant video on sex slaves in Islam and this ex-Muslim interestingly in this video he actually says that he argues that there's actually nothing wrong with slavery in the past. Let's have a listen. That's for you easy to say as a man. Most women don't agree with that. This is simply not established. You would, you would give examples of uh, extreme cases like like uh, a woman would want to uh, rather live with a celebrity and share him with with numerous uh, other women than live alone with uh, some random man. That's also th th that's an extreme example. Uh, it is simply untrue. A woman would not eventually be happier leave it, living with a celebrity just because uh, just because he's a celebrity and she has to share him with with three other uh, women. Uh, what, what the, the thing is also this is an example of deep. Uh, you're a this is a normal example. You know what I I as a man, for example, of course I know, but that's not a that's not a problem. Why, life. why are there groupies if they don't like? That's deviance. Groupies? That's deviance. I would also like oh, to. Deviance. Oh wow. <laughs> It is, it is unanimous in psychology. Both agree that punishments have to exist. They're a necessary evil. No, I don't think so. I then where, think so. where are we going to put the rapists? Corrective behavior. All those Muslim immigrant rapists, where are you going to put them? Corrective behavior. Where? Co they don't want correct. Correct them. Corrective facilities. We, 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 we should. I don't. I don't think. I don't think that a Muslim who is caught raping somebody in the in the in the West, in Germany or in America, should be uh, put onto um, a, a, a thing, a, a a board or whatever it is, and lashed one hundred times. That is, absolutely horrible. That is that is a that is absolutely completely bigger, big bigger. Big. Okay, so here is the part where the ex-Muslim. Uh, says this. Have a listen. I've muted you. Yes, uh, just for a second to say something. You are you are. Silent. But we went into a great uh, conversation on the, on the history and uh, logic of slavery. Whereas I completely agree that slavery is an essential part of human history. For example, you would you would you would think that uh, that I will come with one of those uh, with one of these these typical uh, imbecile objections and will think, oh, slavery is evil. How how dare people ens enslave people in history? How dare the Confederates do this and Muhammad do this and do that? No, I don't I don't think like that at all. I I think that slavery is completely historically logically justified. <laughs> But modern Muslim apologetics get so pathetic that they try to downplay the seriousness of Islamic slavery. They explain how different conditions were there. Islamic slavery was different. Slaves were treated well, but they can just shut up right away. A slave is a slave, an inferior, a tool, an object, a property that you use for help. There is no justification, no excuse to this at all. I, I think that slavery is completely historically logically justified. <laughs> How, how, is that a, how is that a simple question? You would, you would have to think. No, no, it's simple. Happier. The West. So there you go. Um, you see the ex-Muslim contradict himself. Uh, in, in his own private videos, he says that slavery is unacceptable. But when he's speaking to Daniel Hakikato, he's saying that historically, slavery was justified. It, is, it makes sense. It, that's 
that's why it was there um, and so my question now is that Zara Khan is actually friends with this ex-Muslim Apus she's constantly with him she's writing on his videos on his blogs um, and so did she hear him say these words so anyway, I'll put the hyperlink below this video and you can see more detailed refutations to that point. And that Muhammad had given people conditions um, on either accepting Islam, paying, paying tax, tax, or um, getting killed. And that's how most of the wars went in. Um, and then... The part of taking women as slaves from wars and um, differentiating slave women from free women by the use of hijab was very was very suffocating to me, knowing that I am wearing something that other women were not allowed to wear because they were taken as slaves. So basically, it was a form of patriarchy and oppression, and that's how I see hijab. That pushed me to question more about Muhammad's life and I read up extensively on his wives. I knew he had a wife called Aisha. Okay, so before we go to that, um, she mentioned how uh, the spread of wars, that you either had to accept Islam or you had to pay the jizya or get killed. A beautiful video was done by Daniel Hakikato on Islam spread by the sword. So again, I'm going to put a hyperlink below this video so you can see it for yourself. And then she made a claim that slaves weren't supposed to wear the hijab. Let's have a listen to this. This part to me was a bit strange. Let's have a listen. Um, differentiating slave women from free women by the use of hijab was very was very suffocating to me, knowing that I am wearing something that other women were not allowed to wear because they were taken as slaves. So basically, it was a form of patriarchy and oppression. Uh, this is false. Um, to the best of my knowledge, uh, free women and non-free women, uh, you know, wearing the hijab. No, there is no discrimination between the two. If this, if Islam, if if the Sharia law uh, imposes mandatory hijab, that actually applies for slave women as well. It doesn't just apply for um, you know women of your folk. Uh, so you know the Muslims. It also applies for non-Muslims. Non-Muslims living uh, among Muslims. Uh, if there's a if the hijab is mandatory, then they're compelled to wear the hijab as well. Uh, this is under your house, of course. That's how I see hijab. That pushed me to question more about Muhammad's life, and I read up extensively on his wives. I knew he had a wife called Aisha that the Shias really did not like because she went in a war against Ali, who is the grandson of the Prophet. Did you notice Shia? She's a Shia Muslim. She was a Shia Muslim. And their hadiths are separate. They don't believe in, in our hadiths. Their hadiths are separate from ours. And they have a, uh, their interpretation of the Quran can be different too. They don't follow our tefsirs. Um, little did I know that Aisha was six years old when she was married to the Prophet. Didn't I say before the beginning of this video they're going to use the same arguments so it's sex slaves it's um you know she'll bring up apostasy soon i'm pretty sure uh well she did actually i think at the, at the beginning she brought up uh well i'm not sure actually if she brought up apostasy but uh, she will bring that up uh she brought up why she did left god the same argument who created god and now their number one argument is Aisha's age. Um, again, I'll put a hyperlink below this video and you can see it for yourself. We have a beautiful arc article refuting this claim about Aisha's age. And that's saying that she was 18. But 
Then is, if Muhammad had so many wives, why did he need to marry Aisha? She was only six. Why a child? Okay, so uh, the lie, notice that they need to amplify a lie. Uh, she knows, I'm pretty sure she's old enough, and she says, I read it extensively. The hadith actually says at six years old, there was a con there was um, there was a proposition. She was betrothed. There was no marriage. There wasn't an official until she was nine years old. Uh, and I believe personally, she was probably closer to ten, nine and 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 ten or eleven months, because they didn't go by you know the months. So she's probably close to um, uh, ten years old. And we know throughout the ages, the age of consent was very, very low back in ancient times. You know, women would generally uh, go through puberty earlier, procreation, for example. Men and women will die early. You know, um, you know the age expectancy was something like 30. Um, you know, you're lucky to live by that time. And so people would procreate early. Um, and uh, th th this was a fact, and we've put these evidences, we've put, you'll go to the hyperlink, I'll provide that below this video, and you can see it for yourself. There are very, very good arguments that we've made. You know, just 200 years ago, the age of consent uh, in America was something like nine years old. Um, you know, of course, the age of consent has raised. Uh, so... <laughs> Why doesn't she mention she was nine or ten? Why did you, why did you have to force and say it was six? Uh, and again, this is part of them dramatizing it to give you the shock effect. Muhammad married a six or sees to show people that you can marry them. But why did he need to marry Aisha? And why did he need sex slaves out of all of them? Were those wives not enough? There were so many topics about slavery that made me feel that women were not taken as equal as men. Why are men allowed to marry for wives and women not allowed to marry for men? Um, where was the equality in uh, inheritance? Where was the equality in um, in uh, um, testimony? Why are women considered to be half of man's? Um it's you know she's <laughs> she didn't sit there reading the Quran when she was you, you got to understand that. These ex-Muslims are lies, okay? She didn't sit there reading the verses of the Qur'an, going, you know, I'm starting to lose doubt because, you know, my Qur'an is saying this. She's literally paraphrasing what, you know, uh, Western critics of Islam are saying. You know, she's going through exactly the same notions. You know, apostasy, uh, you know, sex slaves... Um, you know, leaving the religion because of, you know, uh, inequality. You know, she mentions, for example, um, you know, the inheritance laws. Well, did you know that the inheritance laws are there? The reason why women get more than men, uh, sorry, why men get more than women is because he is the one that is the provider. He actually has to provide for his Wives, women don't have to spend on men. It's an obligation that men spend on their wives, on women. So this is the reason why men get more is because he must provide for women. Okay, so if she marries, he must provide for her. So she's always got the upper hand. And that's why the inheritance laws favor men and not women. However, that said, it's actually technically really favoring women over men because she's constantly being provided where she doesn't have to spend a single cent, whereas a man does. But see, so this is why I'm saying they're just so ignorant when they're giving these um, claims because they, again, they haven't studied some. She's like, I've really extensively studied it. But what, seriously, what have you studied? What? So you just went and paraphrased, parroted what some Western critics said about Islam, but you haven't really checked the answers. And she says it. She goes, I didn't really have the answers. She goes, I couldn't find the answers. 
Um, and it just goes to show that if she was really honest, she'd have the answers. But again, they're not this, they're dishonest. That is their primary goal to be dishonest. Okay, so gender roles, you know, she wants to talk about gender roles. You know, gender roles exist even in the secular world. You know, no matter how much they want to deny and lie about it, there are gender roles. Um, for example, if you want to be uh, a world champion heavyweight boxer and fight Mike Tyson in a battle and take the world championship off him, you can't be a woman. You have to be a man. <laughs> Simple as that. You can't. Uh, you're not accepted. Men fight men. Women fight women. That's gender roles. Um, but I don't see Sarah Khan complaining about that because there are biological differences. So there are gender roles in Islam as well. Um, you know, there are things that women don't have to do. Uh, for example, women don't have to pay the mahr. Men have to pay the mahr in Islam. Uh, does Zara Kane? Does Zara uh, K complain about that and say, well, you know, why are men being mistreated in Islam? You know, why is it always women? Why, if she is so, uh, if, she, if she doesn't have that feminazi mentality, then why doesn't she pick on that? Why doesn't she say, well, the, well, the Quran also discriminates against men because it, it tells them that they need to pay for the mahr. So gender roles exist in Islam. We're not ashamed of that. Uh, and it's not there to discriminate against women because there are things that women have favour in. There are things that men may be favoured in. Um, and so there's a balance. Uh, so for you to actually say, well, I'm leaving Islam because of that, that's really uh, an, uh, not a valid excuse. Um, and even if you want to make it an excuse... Let's say you do go to your secular theology and philosophy, fine, but where are you going? You're going into something that also has gender differences, gender roles. You have men and women who have separate bathrooms. You have in Australia, I mean, Sarah Kay is from Australia, you have women only schools. Yes, there are intersex schools. But there are also women-only schools. Um, there are places where you will go where there's gyms, women-only fitness gyms, gender roles, um, where men can't be there. It's, it's only a woman's gym. Does she complain about her secular philosophy, her worldview, where it separates men from women? Does Sarah Kay also complain how men are required to pay for all her bills? Um, why doesn't she complain about gender biases there? It is prescribed and it's not optional, it's mandatory that if, you know, if, if jihad happens, men have to go to jihad, women don't have to go to jihad. Um, the, again, does Sarah Kay complain about there about gender biases and say women in Islam are treated unequally when men are actually forced to go to jihad? It's mandatory upon them to go to jihad, uh, but women don't have to. Allah in the Quran calls men to go to jihad, doesn't call upon the women to go to jihad. with wearing hijab when all it is is a form of oppression and i didn't understand why people thought it was liberating it's funny when she says that because when you have a look at france they're actually banning the hijab does sarah k complain about secular liberal laws banning women's hijab you know so uh it's uh not liberating for women to be imposed the hijab but it's liberating women to force them not to wear the hijab. Hmm. Which then pushed me away to remove my hijab and slowly start digging into the different sects of Islam. Uh, you know, and here's another point. Why she got clothes on? She's sitting on that chair. Who forced her to wear those clothes? 
society. Mm? Will she be arrested in public if she takes off her clothes and sits on that chair? Mm? So that's liberating, is it? That she now, now she has a worldview that is liberating, sitting on that chair with her clothes on. And she knows that if she, the moment she t- strips herself, that someone's going to call the police and she's going to be arrested for public indecency and nudity. The Sunni and the Shia sect. I was brought up as a Shia and my family or everybody in my in my community did not agree to getting married to Sunnis. There were very less interracial or intersect, intersect marriages. Um, and I was seeing somebody who was a Sunni and I was trying to learn from him on what the differences were. What I realized is that while they all believed in the God and the Prophet, they had very different ideas about Islam. And the way they practiced it were also very different. One, the Shia being very violent at the time, um, uh, when violent commemorating the death of the grandson of the Prophet, Hussein, and they would beat their chests up and cry and weep, and I never understood it. I had to force myself to cry. And I stopped beating my chest. I stopped going to the mosque when I moved to Australia. I took off my headscarf and I wanted to learn more about religion itself. Um, You know, I already knew it was anti-women, but maybe I was just trying to not understand the other side of it. Okay, do you see what's happened here? She's... (laughs) grown into a Shia family, and these people can be very extreme, like she said, they've got all these weird rituals, they cut themselves up, they beat themselves, there's some, I mean, you can look it up, look at Shia rituals, Shia chanting, and things like that, it's crazy, so I can understand why she's been, she's left um, Shiism, because it is crazy, <laughs> it is, the, some of the rituals that they do, it's just anti-Islam, okay, so it it seems to me that she's come from a family where there were already these perverted teachings about Islam, and this is why I say if you're a Shia Muslim, you got more chances of leaving Islam, uh, well, Shia Islam, than you're a Sunni leaving Sunni Islam, Uh, because, I mean, it's crazy the things that they do, and so she's already been brought up in an environment where she's already built toxicity against Islam. So then what they do is, uh, uh, she didn't doubt Islam like the Quran and all the stuff at the beginning, right? She would have looked at all of these rituals and said, well, that's not for me, right? And then later on in her life, as she says, she goes, then I started researching about the religion And then she started bringing up other excuses to justify the cruelty she was raised in and seeing all these bad rituals around her. And there were so many mental gymnastics I was playing to validate my ideas. But then what I also realized is that Islam is also quite against gay people. It was... Okay, the mental gymnastics argument... (laughs) Right, she was apparently, you know, she was giving herself mental. No, you don't really need to give yourself mental gymnastics. It just shows that you probably don't have coherent arguments addressing the issues. You know, of course, if you're a Shia, you're going to give mental gymnastics about certain answers. But if you're a Sunni, you you're not going to go through mental gymnastics right to give answers to certain questions but of course um, they use the mental gymnastics argument because sometimes these ex-muslims all they could grasp and understand is if it only is a meme anything that goes beyond a meme becomes mental gymnastics for them and that's anything too hard to comprehend because I don't like reading and researching. I had never met a lot of gay people. I didn't even know homosexuality existed until I left Tanzania and grew out of my bubble and met gay people. And I could never stand that these are people who are cursed in religion and 
there are non-believers who are sent to hell and I read up more on tolerance and I put up a post about accepting gay people but all I received was backlash from other Muslims and Muslims asking me to, den to renounce my religion because I supported gay people. And just seeing the vile comments made push me further away from religion because they were right. There is no tolerance in Islam. There is no accepting of, of gay people. There is no accepting of non-believers unless they convert. We're, Quran has verses that condemn non-believers to hell. And the Sharia law has a punishment of throwing gay people off the roof. Not forgetting that women who are raped in Islam and our victims are considered to be criminals as well because how dare she be with the male alone and they are the ones who are punished most in Islam versus their male versus the people who preyed on the woman and this are some of the reasons what pushed me away from Islam the anti-women and the anti-gay was the biggest part once I realized Islam wasn't for me I did you hear what she said the anti-women and anti-gay was the biggest part for her. Um, my question is, is she gay herself? Now, that's a legitimate question because I'd actually want to know if that is a question because, I mean, it'd be, it'd be really... I mean, they're the only people who should really question this because, again, that doesn't affect her. I mean, whether someone is gay or not gay, that shouldn't really affect her faith, where it shouldn't be the leap of faith to say, I'm going to leave my religion because, you know, Islam doesn't give that right to someone else. Why does she even care about gay people? Shouldn't her religion matter the most? Who Shouldn't her heaven or hell matter the most? I mean, we have laws even in the West where, you know, the government doesn't allow ancestral relationships incest is forbidden is sarah k gonna say well i'm going to be an apostate about the government i'm no longer gonna believe in secular liberalism i'm no longer gonna believe in the australian way of life i'm no longer going to believe in this western philosophy because we have laws against ancestral relationships and people who want to commit incest are not given those rights therefore i'm going to now go back to islam or i'm just going to leave islam as well i'm going to leave my government and my secularism and my secular laws i'm just going to go on a planet where no one else exists i'm going to create my own world and i'm going to create my own morals and just i mean is that what they're saying i mean right can you imagine these are their petty these are their childish silly arguments when it comes to gay people i've got a video I'll put a hyperlink below this video i've already addressed this you can see the responses in islam you can't kill a gay person unless and no one can take this law in their own hands. In Islam, gay people are killed and, as she says, thrown off a building. I'm not actually sure on the Sharia ruling on that. Uh, there may be a difference of opinion depending on a different scholar. I'm, But to be clear, yes, there are laws that kill gay people in Islam, just as they, you have laws about killing apostates. And I'll put a hyperlink below this video and you can see that. But there's laws can't be applied because anyone who is gay and anyone who lives in a Sharia state knows that this practice is condemned and you can be put to death for it. So the only way you can actually charge someone who is actually gay if they are vocal and promote their promiscuity and they promote their sexual lust out in the public. Just like Sarah Kay, she's there. She can, you know, she could believe in her liberal ideas about undressing herself and going naked, but she won't do that in a Western government because she'll be arrested. Um, 
you know, and so if you're going to live in a shitty estate, you're going to know that there are laws against gay people. And so the only time you'd be stupid to actually want to get killed by a shittier court is if you go out and start making out in public with another man. Okay? And so any person, right-minded person, would not do that. Islam does not impinge upon your own privacy. So if you're going to be gay, you've got to do it in secret, in the closet. Um, and, you know, that's what they say about religion too. You know, don't impose your religion on our society. If you want to practice your faith, you want to practice your religion, you know, keep it to yourself. Keep it behind closed doors, you know. Actually, they don't even say that. They don't even allow us. I mean, I can't even practice polygamy in this country. They don't say, keep it in your closed doors, you know, keep it in your own privacy. But I, here I am saying, keep your, your homosexuality in your private affairs. Don't bring it out into the public if that's something that, I'm again, I'm not legitimizing it. I'm not saying Islam encourages you to do it in private. No, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is, if you're going to do it, then don't publicize it. And in Islam, you can't spy. You can't go into someone's house and start spying. And so if you're going to publicize it is when you get punished. And so if I wanted to believe in polygamy, I'd have to do it in secret. If I come out, I could get arrested. There could be charges laid against me. You know. And so the, sec the secular world works in a very similar way. Mechanism, of course, you know, Sarah Kay will say, well, you know, the secular government is not going to kill you for, you know, um, marrying a, a secondary wife. Yeah, well, regardless whether it kills me or not, it's still, imp it's still taking my human rights. It's still disallowing me to do something that I don't want to do. And so how is that any different? Yes, we're not. Uh, we're unashamed and unapologetic. Yes, Islam does because, you know, a, uh, HIV and AIDS has, has been spread through this evil practice, um, and you know, there's it breaks the fabric of society. Um, you know, and here's an argument. You know, uh, they asked, uh, "What is wrong with being gay?" And I've actually written about this. So I'll put it here. Um, there are many factors wrong in being gay, but there are three main factors that stick out for me. Firstly, God has designed humankind, male and female, to procreate and have an offspring. However, gay lifestyle obstructs procreation and damages the fabric of society when it comes to procreation. Secondly, every child has a right to have parents of the opposite sex. One may ask, well, what about children who are born to to one parent while the other parent dies well my response is that's something unavoidable but you cannot compare that to same-sex marriages that are designed to have parents of the same sex this is all designed and determined beforehand and not based on a tragic circumstance thirdly every child deserves the right to have be biologically connected to both parents in gay marriages even when an egg is donated, sometimes we don't even know who the donor is, as there are laws to protect the identity of donors. And donors don't like to engage in the upbringing of that child, so the child lives on not even knowing who the real parent is. Also, that egg can only be inseminated by one gay parent and not both gay parents, which means although the child may have two fathers presented to him, the reality is he's only biologically related to only a single parent and not both parents, which can be kind of traumatic knowing that in human nature, parents tend to be much more affectionate or caring or understanding or much more committed when they are biologically related to the child. We know this is true on a general basis. For example, how foster carers can give up on children they cared for even after so many years because they're not really biologically related. Also, one of the parents may feel more connected to the child since he's related while the other father is not. This can also cause friction between the parent and the child. 
Once we can understand these traumatic social factors, we can reason to see why being gay can affect individual and the broader fabric of society. There is no way any gay advocate could possibly argue against the made points. Uh, there was a counter response to this by a critic who wrote, The law of nature is very evolving. By now any human may clone himself and need no other. Some species uh, reproduce asexually aside from numerous variants. And homosexuality seems as a heritable conduct, a consequence of creation. And my response to that is, cloning has improved that same sexes can have genetic biological connection to one child. Until you can prove that, my argument still stands. Also, cloning hasn't solved the issue of child having the right to two parents of the opposite gender. It's not just about procreation, but being raised and nurtured and cared by two different genders that have two different unique characters and biological advantages like having access to fresh breast milk which is vital for the child's health so there are, they are the three main arguments i believe clearly disprove homosexuality and gay people um, and why it's not good for human society and so we leave it the affairs to Allah. Allah knows best. And so we believe in that. And I believe there are substantial points and arguments that show why such laws exist in the first place. Uh, the other point that I wanted to mention is that, you know, uh, Zara Kay believes that terrorism affects human people. Uh, terrorism can be very bad for human civilization, uh, and she probably believes that terrorists should be executed and should be killed because of the harm they cause for society. Uh, and so in Islam, in, in a Sharia court, and again, no one is allowed to take this law into their own hands and start stabbing and killing people because they're homosexuals. This is a law that is put through Sharia systems and, that's, and it's the courts that actually determine uh, and prescribe uh, the killing of homosexuals. And one needs to understand in uh, Islamic jurisprudence is that if you are gay uh, and you don't repent um, and you don't change your lifestyle, yes, you do go to hell. Uh, we're unapologetic about that. Just as if you're an atheist, again, you go to hell. Uh, and again, we're not we're unapologetic about that too. That's the way it is, whether you accept it or not. And if you are gay, then you're promoting your gayness to society and you're legitimizing it and normalizing it for everyone else. And therefore, when people follow that idea, um, they also end up in hell, which is really bad for society because they're getting sent to their own doom. And that's why it is bad for human civilization because they can end up in a really bad place. Now, you may say, well, as an atheist, you don't really believe in judgment. Though. You don't really believe in heaven. Now, well, that's regardless because we do believe in that. And we do believe in God, we do believe it's true, and therefore we want to protect society from going to that really bad place. And so, just as you want to protect your society against terrorists, uh, because they could harm people, we also want to protect society, and that's why we call people to the right path just as you may call people to the right path from wanting to become a terrorist and a suicide bomber. So we do the same. And what happens when a person wants to be a gay person and he openly tries to be a gay person and promotes his gay person? Well, according to Shidia, he gets killed. What happens to a person when he wants to promote his terrorism, when he wants to promote his... Uh, you know, his murder, when he wants to say that it is okay to kill innocent people, 
uh, who were, you know, uh, Christians, um, you know, non-enemy combatants, and you want to go go to a marketplace and you want to blow yourself up, well, you would say that this terrorist needs to be executed under secular liberal laws. Well, of course, in Islam, there's execution for terrorists as well. I'm not saying there isn't. But, yeah, so you have laws of execution because you understand that that person caused harm to society. So we have the same with gay people. It's just the other side of the coin, Zara. It's the other side of the coin. By the way, the same standard applies for apostasy. You know, these people invite, like people like Zara K in art, invite people to hellfire. She calls people to hellfire. She's inviting people to hellfire. Apostasy, so the same rules apply for apostasy. Now, some people may say, oh, well, look, you know, Islam can't stand criticism. Islam can't stand... No, Islam can stand criticism because Islam doesn't encourage Christians who question Islam to get killed. Islam doesn't encourage atheists who question Islam to get killed. But there are people who are vocal apostates who are ex-Muslims who question the faith. And the, and the reason, again, why these people get put to death is because, of course, if you're a vocal ex-Muslim, you get put to death, but if you're non-vocal, nothing happens to you. You can just live in, keep your thoughts to yourself. You, you want to disbelieve, no problem. But once you become vocal, you're inviting people to hellfire. You're basically a demon, a devil calling people to hellfire. And you may say, well, doesn't that apply for Christians? No, it doesn't, because ex-Muslims are given, give themselves the title of authority. I know many people who say that that person must say the truth. They, it, it must be true what they're saying because they used to be an ex-Muslim. It means that they were a professional Muslim and therefore whatever they say must be true. And so because of this deceitful nature, this cunning behavior, this misleading behavior, that's why Islam puts an end to their, uh, to their lives because they hijack the religion um, and they, they easily trick others uh, in following um, what they say to be true more. Uh, and that's why the Western world, the academic world, the, 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 the media will, will always invite an ex-Muslim to speak on behalf of Islam because they'll say, well, that person knows about Islam. That person was trained about Islam. That person was... And so they try and use these people to hinder other people. It's more effective if an ex-Muslim speaks about uh, in their criticism about Islam than a Christian talking about their criticism of Christianity. And we know this because... Um, for example, if a Muslim was to criticize the Bible, um, you know, Christians don't really take that seriously. But if an ex-Christian who was a scholar of the religion, if he started questioning Christianity, that hurts Christians more. Um, and that, that, that affects them more. Uh, similarly, for example, if any atheist started saying, well, you know what, um, I'm going to leave atheism and I'm going to accept Islam. If it's just any random atheist, this isn't really going to hurt the atheist community. But if someone like Christopher Hitchens, someone prominent, if he left atheism and came to Islam, now that's going to get a lot of atheists to question and say, well, look, he was trained in atheism. And so... You know, whatever he says now against atheism must be true. And so that same example is now put on the ex-Muslims. You've got to understand that these people are, you know, most of them are not trained. Like Zara Kane doesn't know. She admits she didn't know answers. So it shows that she didn't, ha she wasn't trained in Islam. And so when she comes out... and. 
And that's why people like her would always say things like, she, she'll always say she's an ex-Muslim. Like she could have said Zara K, saying why I left Islam. But notice in her video she put ex-Muslim, hashtag ex-Muslim. She has to say ex-Muslim because that way people are going to take her more seriously. And so this is why in Islam I believe that these types of people deserve to get the had punishment under, under a Sharia system because they present themselves as knowledgeable. They present themselves as genuine people who understood the religion and then they claim that they've left something they really understood uh, and, and so, they, so they deceive others and trick others to prove that they were an expert in Islam. And this is why Islam puts to death such people because they're more um, persuasive to manipulate and lie to people uh, about, about Islam. Uh, and so, again, if these people are leading people to hellfire, uh, then it just as terrorists may harm people, then yes, they deserve to be punished. Uh, and by the way, uh, you may say, well, that's just a bit harsh and you're, you're a bit radical and, and all this garbage. You know, when you end up on the Day of Judgment and when you see hellfire, and you see the punishment for those who have rejected faith and all of these poor people that you have, these innocent people that you have persuaded to go to hellfire, you're going to, you know, those people who go to hellfire because of people like Zara Kay who have misled them, you're going to come back to me on the day of judgment and you're going to say, I wish Sharia law put to death people like Zara Kay because it's because of Zara K we're actually here where we are today in Hellfire. They're going to thank. They're going to they're gonna thank people for putting such apostates to death. They're going to thank them. Uh, they're going to thank Shri Allah. And for those apostates who haven't been put to death, who have misguided people, they're going to probably question and say, we wish Islam put them to death. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been misguided today and we wouldn't have been ended up where we are today. I realized Islam wasn't for me. I went, I started talking to other ex-Muslims. It was a world that I didn't even know existed. I started learning more about them. I started reading books. Um, I started reading The Atheist Muslim. I started reading Richard Dawkins' books. I even started reading more of the Quran to understand why there were ex-Muslims. Um, I started finding... Did you notice how she said, I started reading more of the Quran? Uh, and this is after she said she read Richard Dawkins' books. <laughs> um, notice, if she was grounded, why is she saying, I started reading more of the Quran? So it seems to me that she already had doubts, uh, but and she really didn't know much about the Quran, but she later read more about the Quran uh, and again it goes to show that she wasn't a fully practicing Muslim uh, and as doubts crept in she then started researching a bit more into the Quran which goes to show that she wasn't really grounded in the faith she really didn't research her faith before she even accepted that thank you for